here on the NEBDR. This is a pretty technical section. We're running a, a AX41 Bridgestone tire. Uh, it's an excellent choice for a route like this. Excellent grip in the mud. Also really good on the pavement, sticky on the twisties. The Bridgestone AX41s, they're a, a dual sport tire. Having a really good time with it. Hi, I'm Max Stratton from Max BMW Motorcycles. We have four locations in the Northeast and we've been in business for 17 years. A Max BMW had to be involved with BDR. Uh, you guys are going to be in the backyard of almost all the Max BMW motorcycle dealerships. If a rider comes into Max BMW needing help getting ready for the BDR, we can help accessorize uh, their apparel, we can help accessorize their bike, uh, we can help service their bike and then put them in touch with other people uh, that also are doing the BDR. It's important for KTM to support the BDR and the community of the adventure riders. We have the bike to do these routes. You know, people want to be a part of it and they can go out and do these rides all over now. We support the people that are doing the rides and the community works hand in hand. You know, it's, it's huge for KTM. BDR is a great thing to get into. I'm pumped that I did it. You know, I want to come back and I want to bring some friends with me. connected. I'm Tim James, I'm Route Development Lead for the Northeast Backcountry Discovery Route. Recently, when we hosted the Adventure Out Space at the International Motorcycle Show in New York, the most asked question was, when is the Northeast Route coming? Many of the people we spoke to had already done the Mid-Atlantic BDR and were ready for the next East Coast BDR. So the second most asked question was, is it going to be a tougher route? Are we going to step up our game a little? The Northeast BDR travels 1,400 miles through seven states on backcountry roads. It starts in Hancock, New York, and then quickly dips down into Pennsylvania before entering back into New York and continuing on through Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. It ends at the Canadian border about 15 miles north of Jackman, Maine. So in New York, the route winds through Delaware County and then into the heart of the Catskill Mountain region. It eventually heads down into the Hudson Valley and, and over to the Massachusetts border. It's a mix of backcountry dirt roads, including some seasonal roads, some forest service roads, and we link that all together with pavement. And when there is pavement, it's really great twisty pavement. There's nothing overly technical in New York, although there are a few little sections with some surprises. It's definitely a great way to warm up for the challenges ahead on this route. Most of Connecticut and Massachusetts is extremely rural, so that I think is going to be the surprise for folks who travel the Northeast BDR. Vermont is the Green Mountain State. We've got a real array of, of twisty mountain paved roads that are very, very fun, and then unmaintained roads that are just so interesting, uh, ever-changing. We have some really pretty roads, nice flowing roads through New Hampshire. So I think you're going to hopefully be impressed with the scenery and the roads we go on. I think Maine is the essence of backcountry discovery. We're going to go out and see very remote areas, far away from human beings, where it's going to be a great experience for everybody. <laughs>
So the BDR made it out east a few years ago where we had the Mid-Atlantic Backcountry Discovery Route. So now we're following up with our second route on the east coast. This one's a northeast BDR. Ten years ago when we created this BDR concept, we wanted to make it easy for people to come out here and follow in our footsteps and have the adventure of a lifetime without having to do all the planning it takes to put together something like this. I've been riding in New York State for probably 15 or 20 years. And over the years, I've gone from just being a road rider to being an adventure rider. And so for the last 10 or 12 years, I've been exploring the backcountry of, of New York, and that really was helpful in putting this route together. This is my fourth BDR expedition. The last time I was riding on the East Coast was on the Mid-Atlantic BDR, and I'm really anxious to explore the Northeast part of the country, especially being here in September. I'm looking forward to seeing the fall colors that the East Coast is so famous for. We've got a lot of people on the team uh, this year. Um, our sort of guest celebrities are Jocelyn Snow. She's of GS Trophy fame. Being a, a smaller female, riding big motorcycles and doing this adventure riding thing, I kind of made it like, for me, my internal mission to inspire other riders, to inspire women, short riders, men, even riders who've been riding for many, many years, to get out and, and see some new places. I mean, the world is, is a huge adventure. And then Mike Lafferty, eight-time AMA Enduro champion, he's here. This is sort of his old stomping grounds where he ran a lot of Enduros over the years. I grew up in, in South Jersey. I was born and raised and I still live uh, close by. I raced with KTM for 20 years. I retired in 2014. Um, I still got a job with KTM. I do street demos, off-road demos, motocross demos, and also a lot of events like the rider rallies. We've got a support vehicle on this to help carry all the extra gear and the camera equipment and an extra motorcycle in case someone drops theirs in a river. I've done the BDR ride uh, a few times now. Being that, I decided that I would do the chase truck. So we started the ride today in Manhattan, New York City. Coming across the GW Bridge and leaving the madness of the city behind, I wanted this group to feel what it's like and head out to an, a BDR right from the metropolitan area. So we're here at the start of the Northeast BDR in Hancock, New York, where the east and the west branch of the Delaware River converge to create the headwaters of the Delaware River, which then travels 300 miles to the Atlantic Ocean. Hancock, New York, is a, a very a dirt bike friendly community. Every year they host the Hancock Dual Sport. That's been going on for years and the quarry run. I was excited when I heard it started in Hancock. For me, it brings back a, a lot of memories, a lot of cool stuff from racing. There was a World Enduro there and I think it was 05 or 06. It was by far the hardest race I've ever done. All right, we're gonna give you an Irish blessing to get you on your way and get you back home safe and sound. May you have safe travels. In Adam and Ara, August and Vic, August and Sprid, Nave, Amen. Go forth and ride, okay? Thank you, Rosie. All right, guys. Hancock, New York is right on the New York PA border. So this ride is actually going to start in New York, but transition quickly to Pennsylvania, where we'll follow the Delaware River all the way down to the town of Calicoon, and we'll cross again back into New York State. You know, pretty early in the day, we got on some tight, uh, sort of rocky, it was like, almost like a Jeep trail, pretty narrow. It was pretty fun on these bikes. It had a good flow to it, and you know, just chasing the person in front of you, it was really fun. You know, I'm getting used to some things with the, riding with the panniers and stuff, so I'm having some fun so far. I had an espresso already, so my morning's looking good. This trip has really opened Mike's eyes to adventure riding. You know, he's been on the bikes, he leads these demo rides all the time, but he's never loaded up the bike with luggage, camping gear, and just gone for any number of days, let alone 10 days. I never had my panniers full, you know, all that type of stuff, so that's all new to me, and I'm definitely jumping in there with this, as, you know, as a rookie for sure. That section rocked. A little bit uh, wet, you know, it's in the shade, so it's not too hot. It's green, the sun is creeping through the trees, and there's no dust. I mean, pinch me, am I dreaming? What is this town? How do you pronounce it? 
Uh, Calicoon. What do you do for fun in Calicoon? Well, there's uh, three liquor stores, four bars. And there's a lot of live music, and that's it. You sort of bar hop. There's limited uh, slim pickings when I, if you're looking for dates. Pretty much that's it. Okay, so some slightly bad news. Oh, is it closed? It's closed. I really appreciate you telling me how good the food is here when the restaurant is closed. <laughs> I'm sorry, Paul. We started off with a lot of changes from the street to the dirt and then back to the street again, lots of different sections. It seemed like the, the dirt roads were fun and, and some of them were graded and some had just a little bit of texture to make it technical enough and, and then it would go right back to graded and then you're on a ribbon of, of curvy smooth roads. Any indication of what we're going to expect here for the next several days? <laughs> I'm in heaven right now. It's the middle of September and it's the perfect time. The weather is absolutely perfect and the sun is bright. It's, it's, it's going to be a fantastic week. And if we look due east this way, it's the Catskills. We're actually at one point going to go above the Catskills and then drop back down into the Catskills. So we're going to be trying to hit most of the, the state forests that we can. So it's really, um, really great state forest roads. Andes is a super cool town. We stayed in the Andes Hotel last night. We had breakfast across the street, a diner, and we're ready to hit the Catskills today. We are filling up at the Trepper Skill store. It's another general store in town. And then Ed and Candy have uh, got some fresh donuts and probably some pie for us, and we're gonna fill up with gas, and then we're gonna head across to the Pacton. So Candy, we have the We Support BDR Rider sticker that you can put on your window. Okay. So when motorcyclists start coming your They'll way next year, guys. yeah, you, they know to stop here. Okay. And it's just, it goes on the, on the window. One of the best parts about riding these routes is the little towns you stop in, you get, you get to meet the locals. They don't get to see this every day. These bikes rolling in through town with all the boxes and camping gear. They want to know, like, where are you from? How are we doing? Good, how are you? Yep, good. Dale Henderson, a local from here. Yeah, he's got a Harley Davidson and he's got more chrome on that thing than you can believe. He was so happy to hear about our story and what we were doing and he, he promised me that he was going to get riding on his bike again and next time, next year when I came through, he was going to ride with us. Keep it on two wheels <laughs> in between the ditches and have, enjoy your day. I just, I love it. It gets me all teared up. <laughs> We're going to be traveling through um, the Catskill Park, which is a state park at 700,000 acres of forever wild. And what that means is that it can never be built or logged. Um, it's owned by the state and it's, it's basically there for our enjoyment. It seemed like we were along a creek more than we weren't. So there's water everywhere and the name Catskill comes from the word um, catamount, which is a mountain line. And the word hill in Dutch means creek. Oh, water. So, um, yeah, so yeah. that's where they came up with the name of uh, the Catskill Mountains. And these little creeks and streams that come off the mountains then feed bigger creeks and bigger rivers that pour into all the, the reservoir system here in the Catskills. One we went over was built in the 40s, and that water system supplies New York City with all of their water. Its proximity to the city is about 120 miles to New York City, so it's the first real destination as you travel upstate to be able to do some wonderful um, recreational activities. There you go. 
Joanna? 75% of our business is stocking a lot for them. private fishing clubs, landowners. A lot of our fish go out of here live. On a good day, we probably put 4,000 fish out of here. Yeah. Well, we walk down by the by the ponds there, and they're they're jumping right clear out of the waters. You bring your own gear, and you fish in our pond, and you pay six dollars a pound for what you catch. <laughs> this might not happen, you guys. <laughs> oh yeah, there you go, real. I think we might be hungry at our campsite tonight. And it's a good thing because Ina didn't catch any fish at the hatchery, so we're going hungry tonight. This is going to be one of my favorite meals in life, I think. <laughs> One of the objectives of the Northeast BDR was to ramp it up a little bit uh, uh, from the MABDR. I'm really anxious to see what the crew thinks as we travel north, it'll get more and more technical. So what do you think for like a, your average adventure rider with a fully packed um, GS? I love that stuff. I can ride that stuff for days. I think it's doable for everybody. Because yeah. you're going downhill, you know, and downhill still takes some technique, but it's better than struggling trying to get up it. Well, that's a little piece of what we have coming up north. You keep teasing me, Tim. All right, I'm telling Give you. Give it to me, buddy. Man, that was an action-packed boulder garden on a decline that just kept on giving. Very technical, loose. I mean, there was rocks, like, yeah. Football size that yeah. were rolling down the trail coming Giant off the of wheels. laptops and TVs. <laughs> that was, I think, the most challenging thing we've we've hit so far. I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we survived. Did. We did. Boom. <laughs> In 2011, Hurricane Irene ripped through New York and a lot of the small towns throughout the Catskills took a beating. Prattsville was among the worst hit. All of the businesses on Main Street were pretty much devastated and almost every resident was displaced from their home. They did get some relief and the community rallied and were able to put their town back together. But it took a long time. The bridge that we're standing on just got completed last year and it happened eight years ago. So part of our mission as in the BDR, as you know, is to bring uh, money into these towns that could use some help. So what we want to do is we want to encourage um, BDR riders, stop into Prattsville. There's a diner, there's a couple of motels, there's some restaurants. Stop in, spend some money here if you can, because they sure could use the business. It's the longest single span covered bridge in the world. The day got away from us, huh? Got we away had too from much us. fun catching fish, <laughs> eating food. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> catching fish? Well, yeah, we caught some, some fish for dinner. Yeah. Where were you? How big was it? I missed the part where you This big! <laughs> it's nice to have another lady on the ride. A lot of group rides, I've, I've found myself as the only female. Not that that's a big deal, but it, it is kind of a big deal to have another female on the ride. We have been a great GS Trophy team. <laughs> <laughs> This will work. We'll share this tent, and then in the other tent, we'll put up and we'll put our gear in it. All right, keep keep it dry. Okay, so we're gonna have a meal. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, we're a little bit late. We had some technical bike issues today. One of the crew has a bike that won't start, so we've got some people out there trying to get that rectified, and we'll see when they roll in. He pulled over to the side of the road, put his kickstand down, and right when he put the kickstand down, it, he walked away from it, and then and the bike uh, sunk into the asphalt kind of and tipped over. We couldn't figure it out, so it looks like uh, best case scenario is do some towing.
Mike towed Eli a really long distance, he towed it into the dark, and uh, they made it back to camp. I've never seen anyone tow a big, fully loaded bike that distance. How many miles? 48. 48 miles. Probably took us, what, an hour and a half or something? Yeah. I knew he'd be able to, to do it, and um, once you get rolling, but there's some times, too, it get a little sketchy here and there, and then when we had some deer run out in front of us, that got a little, little hairy. Hardest part was it was getting really cold. We got to get here, so I wasn't going to stop. Dude, that was yeah. killer. Nice work, yeah, man. Good job, man. Uh, three minutes until three minutes until take takeoff. <laughs> okay. It's not even seven o'clock yet. So we were a little late the last couple of days, but I think we're finally getting into our BDR groove. So my bike still wasn't starting, so uh, Tim has offered to loan me his rallied out Husqvarna 701. So we had a, a spare bike that was in the trailer just for this sort of reason, and so Eli rode a, a Husqvarna the rest of the trip. Day three of our adventure, we're gonna be going through three states. We're gonna continue in New York. We're going to do a little bit of Connecticut. The bulk of our day will be in Massachusetts, enjoying the Berkshire Mountains. We will end today at the top of Mount Greylock, and we're going to stay in an amazing lodge that overlooks all of the, uh, the Berkshires. We took a different approach to developing the Northeast BDR than, than other routes. We recruited a group of specialists from each state that we'll be running through. For Connecticut and Massachusetts, we chose Victoria Zandanella. She leads a group called the Northeast Dual Sport Riders, so she's used to plotting these routes out and leading people. The neat thing you're going to find out about the Northeast route is each section changes dramatically. Uh -huh. You're going to get a different look, a different feel. I met up this morning with the BDR team in a town called Catskill. And Catskill is an old industrial era town, um, heyday of the 1800s. And uh, they're going through quite a nice little um, urban re renaissance right now. After a quick breakfast, uh, we went across the Rip Van Winkle Bridge. And if you look to the west, you can see a beautiful view of the Hudson River and the Catskills beyond. We're climbing out of the Valley of the Hudson um, through a series of, of tar roads, a lot of bucolic countryside. After that, uh, we find our way into a town called Copake. Um, one of the interesting things about Copake is the old iron furnace and museum that sits in Copake. This particular furnace was active anywhere between 1860 and 1920. There are probably 20 to 30 furnaces in this area in various states of disrepair. This one was almost demolished. So what you see here is what's left, but there were buildings and towers and, and a train track to bring all the raw ore in and dump it into the furnace. So it's a pretty complicated operation, you know, back in the day, but uh, this is what's left. So we have all these historical bits to see. From Copake, the ride gets interesting. Uh, we go up onto Sunset Rock Road, which comes up over a series of mountains and brings us up to the Massachusetts border with New York. Once we head south from Massachusetts down into Connecticut, we come across Mount Riga. And Mount Riga is one of the highest elevation points in the state of Connecticut. There's also a natural spring that comes out of a rock. Uh, you can fill up your water bottles there and it's a nice rest stop uh, right near Riga Lake. We are inside the furnace. And if you look up, you can see the sky. In Connecticut, there's also a great stopping spot called Campbell Falls. It's a beautiful waterfall, one of the highest falls in the state. You can walk down to the falls and see the area a little bit, have a snack, 
And then from there, we roll up into the Berkshires, and the Berkshires are known in southern New England for some of the best, most quality dirt road riding. What a lovely little New England dual track, huh guys? Fern lined forests, shade, and beautiful white gravel winding itself through the forest. Does it get better than that? Welcome to New England. Nice job. That little XT rips. Pretty tiny bike, Paul. Uh, it's got 16 horsepower at the rear wheel. These little things are small but mighty. You know, people take these things around the world. A lot of people don't think they're capable, but trust me, they are. And I've had a lot of fun on my little bikes, so uh, more people should get out on little bikes every once and again and enjoy it. Look at that! What do you think? It fits! Try that one out! A bike that fits Jocelyn. <laughs> so Jocelyn, all the ladies are asking how you get on that big bike. Because you can't really touch the ground with your feet, right? Yeah, so the secret is a full bowl of Lucky Charms in the morning before a heavy ride. There's a lot of history here, but more so rural beauty and forests and small mountains and lots of wildlife. Uh, it's beautiful meandering uh, dirt roads through the forest uh, that wind their way up through state forests such as Beartown and October Mountain. The difficulty level of the trails start heading upwards as you get into Massachusetts. I guess with the elevation, it probably gets, uh, so does the, the difficulty level. Look at you, all, right. all back in shape. Like new. Ready to go, you're a rock star. This Northeast BDR, there are a lot of fun two-track forest roads and one might be going uh, way too fast when they're having a lot of fun on those roads and then end up in a ditch with a big bang. That's what happened to me anyways. I'm going in a little bit too fast in the corner and got, in, got my bike in the bushes. No, you didn't. <laughs> Some of these corners, they just come up super fast and I think that's what happened. I just like felt invisible having so much fun on this pretty, you know, pretty easy gravel road. And uh, that's what you have to look for. I think like I wasn't watching my speed, that's the thing. I was just like... I'm not joking. When I, you, you got started and you stopped at that one intersection, like slowed down to see the track. You took off and you just whoosh, down the hill. I was like, oh shit. Uh -huh. And you were out of sight. I took a big blow to my forehead. Uh, my helmet was completely destroyed, uh, but my bike was intact and my body was feeling fine. So that's just part of the journey. I'm happy I'm still here and uh, I'm not hurt and I'm having a blast. Good time. I'm sorry you can keep up. I yeah, tried to wait for you around the corners. But. <laughs> Next time. Seeing Mike and Jocelyn together uh, has been a blast. Uh, there's a little bit of a uh, uh, competition going on, you know, her being on the uh, BMW, him being on the KTM, um, and then just the banter between the two of them, it's, it's hilarious. I was pretty nervous at first, like, oh gosh, you know, this guy's gonna come rolling in on his KTM and show me what's up, and he did. That was part of all that rock, rock climbing and look at that. Well, I'm glad we brought some girls on this trip to fix Mike's bike for him. I was a little surprised, you know, when we showed up and, you know, the girls were going to ride with us. I've seen women ride before and it's no big deal, but it was uh, a little more surprising when Justin's on her big, you know, 1200 and I'm like, man, how's this going to work out? Jocelyn had a little get off. She's walking around like nothing yeah. happened. Uh, and there was some kind of water bars. So I saw a really nice one and throttled into it. What I didn't see was what was on the other side, um, which was a, another one. And I, uh, I nosed into it and I eventually parked the bike on the side of the road. The bike uh, crashed dramatically. The bike crashed? 
I didn't have anything to do with it. She had nothing to do with the crash. So. <laughs> oh, and the cylinder has a hole. Where's your stand? How big? Was it bigger than the fish you didn't catch yesterday? <laughs> After Jocelyn's crash, we could tell there was oil leaking from her left cylinder head. It obviously had to be patched. There was no way it was getting out of there the way it was. We are sponsored by Max BMW, um, and we are calling Max right now. Max has got four locations throughout the Northeast BDR, and they're gonna pull a valve cover off of an existing bike and meet us in the town nearby where we're staying tonight. So once again, Max BMW to the rescue. Things aren't going according to plan, hence no, the you, adventure. You have, you have kind of screwed up the plan a little bit, but we still love you dearly. Yeah, we've got we've got the, the valve cover off now with a big hole in it, and we've got some people who are fairly mechanical here trying to at least rig it so we can get her, you know, out. I looked around in the bushes, found an old can of Bud Light. Luckily, John Beck had a Rambo knife, so we were able to cut it into a, a piece and patch it over the hole with some JB Weld. Hey, John, make sure that we can read the Bud Light. We'll do. Yeah, yeah. If we didn't find that can, if we didn't have JB Weld, there's, there's no way we'd get out of there. Finished it up, put everything away, got all suited up, put my helmet on, everyone was ready to go, bikes are starting up. And I go to take a leak real quick before we go. And all of a sudden, I'm feeling this burning. And when I had bear spray uh, that was connected to one of the panniers, the bear spray, spray blew open and it was uh, leaking out spraying out all over the bike. And I realized somehow I got a little bear spray on my hands and and it went down south and it was burning. We all got maced and <laughs> and the more we've tried to, we've got baby wipes and we're trying to wipe it off, the more you touch it. But the worse baby it wipes aren't the answer. Like, bear spray, baby yeah. wipes, no. Because I feel bad for what a bear would feel. If a bear was going to feel yeah. this, I mean, yeah. I, this is... This you, don't, you don't feel bad for us. <laughs> what you did to all your friends on the BDR, you're good with that. But you're worried about what you might potentially do to a bear. Is that what My you're saying? My bike makes you. That's what you're saying. Why did it make you? My <laughs> bike did it. <laughs> Mount Greylock is the highest point in Massachusetts and, and the route winds its way up through some beautiful dirt roads uh, towards the summit. There is a memorial tower to the soldiers of Massachusetts from the First World War that sits atop Greylock with a light and you can see that light at night uh, for all, from all the surrounding towns. You can see up to 90 miles from the top of Greylock. You can see the states of Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont from the top as well. Back in the 30s, uh, the Bascom Lodge was built by the Civil Conservation Corps, the CCC, and it is a, uh, a spot along the Appalachian Trail. Uh, several through hikers uh, will stop there on their way north or south, and it's a great arts and crafts lodge built of local timbers and stone and definitely a spot that I'd recommend for anybody visiting. Okay, the route descends from Greylock down Rockwell Road, which is a beautiful piece of twisty tar. From there, we go into Savoy State Forest, which uh, we'll find some real technical class four enjoyable riding. Yesterday was quite a uh, tragic ending to the day. I had a pretty big fall, um, but nothing broken, nothing's broken on my bike. Um, I'm a little sore, just like Jocelyn. And it's been beautiful so far, so now I'm excited to uh, redeem myself. <laughs> Go have some fun. I was a little skittish at, at the beginning, but they're super fun. Not extremely challenging, uh, probably intermediate, you know, with nice flow and a little bit of loose rock, but super fun BDR road. At the very beginning, I was, I was leading, and the amount of pressure to have Mike Lafferty on your back tire is, it gets in your head. So many times your jaw was just dropped in, in, in amazement of how he can ride a, a fully loaded adventure bike. You know, a lot of people go, oh, you know, Mike's gonna do this, it must be gnarly, it must be tough, it must be fast. Man, I'm so over going fast. You know, that stress of having to go fast all the time wore on me quite a bit when I tried to do it for 20 years. So for me, just to get through something, whether it's super slow or whatever, as long as I get through it, I'm good with it. 
and the route moves north over the Mohawk Trail from there to Monroe State Forest um, with a great stop called the Raycroft Lookout that looks over the Deerfield River Valley. And from there, the route ascends up into Vermont. Guys, this is Eric Milano. He was our, our, our Vermont local and expert um, on the NEBDR development. Well, welcome to Vermont. This is the line Woo! right here. So some of right you still on. haven't crossed over yet. So <laughs> your, your life is gonna change when you come on this side of the line. This is a class three road that we're on right now. It's a maintained gravel road. We have lots of these through Vermont. Um, we're gonna turn in, this is gonna turn into a class four road. Class four is an, a completely unmaintained road. At one point it was a road. It was the road uh, probably sometime in like 1790 something. So you cross into Vermont uh, on a beautiful dirt road from Massachusetts. Um, almost immediately we do uh, come across some class four roads. You come into some rocks, you come into some mud. Definitely will have you uh, sweating right off the bat into Vermont. I think as soon as we pass into Vermont, Lafferty looked at me and said, I think I'm gonna like Vermont. Now that's where the fun begins. That was so much fun. Super rocky. Think what you guys think for like an average rider on a 1200 GS. You probably want to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. So on the class four roads, you won't see a lot of homes within the middle of the roads, but on either end, uh, you will see homes a lot of times. And a lot of times the class four roads start in their driveway or right next to their house, sometimes between their, their home and their barn. So really, really be really respectful when you're coming through these. These are people's backyards that we have access to travel through. Another thing to think of is when you uh, finish the class four road, there might be another house on the other end. So let's not all jump off our bikes and you know start hooting and hollering and high-fiving each other because we just got through that tough section because you know someone's baby might be sleeping or somebody just you know might be sitting on their porch. When you come out of those first few class four roads, uh, you're back on pavement, some of the best pavement in Vermont, actually some of my, my favorite roads. And then you pop into the Green Mountain National Forest. We'll pop out onto some back roads, some paved, some unpaved. Got a couple of little class four roads in there, nothing too major for the afternoon. And I, I think it's a really good mix that'll keep people uh, constantly interested and constantly engaged in the route and wondering what's next. All of a sudden you pop into this little neighborhood of houses. Their lawns were perfectly manicured, looked like golf courses. People are sitting on the front porch waving at you. Some of my favorite things about riding around Vermont are stopping at the general stores. I'm a big proponent of general stores. I think they're just the coolest things ever. Uh, the general store was once the, uh, the old school Walmart to these little places. They had everything, fishing tackle, meat, ammo, I mean, whatever you needed, and they still do. A lot of these towns are an hour away from a big uh, box store or even a supermarket in, in many cases, so they depend on their general stores, and uh, the general stores do a really good job of, uh, of appeasing the locals and the tourists. Their cheddar cheese, they're known for their cheddar cheese. Eric it's said, like somebody took a, took a like dish. that, like that. <laughs> so that nailed it. They make it. They make it right outside of town. I think they have their own cheese factory. A lot of local cheddar all through Vermont, but Grafton is definitely one of my top three. It's a good place to definitely park the bike and walk so around the cute. town. Little white picket fences and the, the trees with the orange leaves. I mean, this is this is cool. Yeah. hard to believe that there's five more days of riding. Today was the most technical day of the trip. A lot of loose rock, uphill, downhill, muddy, definitely expert only section. 
class four we hit today was phenomenal. Well, this is some of the hardest stuff I've ever ridden a fully loaded big bike on. It was tough. The rocks were big and loose and you just had to stay on the gas and go wherever your bike was pointing. Best moment of the day for me uh, was going where there were kind of huge rock ledges. Um, and I just kept going. When I went back to look for a phone that we lost and I looked at what I rode over, there's no way I would ever think that I could ride through some of those sections. The coolest part about the BDR is over the course of uh, you know nine days, you really uh, able to practice all these skills that you maybe learned at the off-road class and uh, I was really trying to follow good riders today and copy what they're doing and practice some of the tips that I picked up. There's a couple sections where I jumped the rock and then just kind of you know got scared and, and looked down and then that's when you fall down. Today we kind of dished it up a bit. We had some texture, we had some mud with big deep slippery ruts that would just kind of like change your line without you getting ready for it. We had some rocks um, that had some slippery moss on it which uh, also spiced things up a little bit. Now the bike she is on is a 1200 GS. It is a really large bike and if you're you know six foot two and you can dab you can kind of get yourself through that but she's like five foot one and she can't dab. I mean, she simply can't. And so she has chosen a very difficult bike to get through some of these sections on. Really haven't had at any point where I wished I was on a smaller bike or, or bigger bike. Ever since we got into Vermont, it's been crazy. There's class four roads. I would find every one there is around here and ride those. It's a little different with the panniers on and the bigger bike. It's fun, you know, I like the challenge of that stuff, so I really enjoy that. We see Mike do some extreme jumps uh, in the film, but I just want everybody to know that those are staged uh, shots. Uh, we definitely don't recommend that you would try anything like that. You know, he's a professional rider, uh, and we're adding those shots just for the excitement to the film. Yeah, we had a little play time today. We got to a class four that had a couple of rock step ups. And so I ran the helmet camera and followed Mike Lafferty too closely. And then we had the other, you know, photographers and video guys uh, getting shots of him, you know, riding wheelies up big rocky things that or would be hard for most people to go up. For the expert only sections, we are going to offer alternate routes. However, without adversity, you don't really have adventure and there's nothing to remember. So I would say even if you're not an expert rider, but you with a group of uh, good teammates and, and uh, good riders, you can definitely do it if you work as a team. Uh, I'm glad I did it. I considered maybe not doing these sections today, but uh, I did it and I'm, I'm glad I, I did. We're out here in this beautiful field. We're about to hit Route 100. So this is a cool stop right here because this is an old BMW shop. Uh, a guy named David Siegel used to repair uh, airhead BMWs up until about eight years ago when he passed away, unfortunately. But um, they put as a memorial a, uh, an old airhead BMW sitting out in this field. So I always ride by and, and think about him and, uh, and uh, appreciate his work on, on all the bikes that he uh, fixed and repaired and, and restored. So uh, my bike included. So Very kind cool. of a cool little spot. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Also enjoyed the little town that we came to. Uh, we had lunch, a quick lunch stop at the little bookstore, and that was really neat. The food was amazing. In Ripton, Vermont, Eric took us on a short hike up into the woods to this old log cabin where the famous American poet Robert Frost lived, and he wrote a lot of his well-known poems there, including The Road Not Taken, which as adventure writers, I think we can relate to that poem. It was really cool to look inside the window of this old cabin and see this old leather chair sitting next to this beautiful stone fireplace where I'll bet he wrote a lot of those poems. It's all on the honor system. It's all the honor system. So everybody puts in uh, their cash here. You write down what you got. And it's all all the meat and the, it's the all beef right and here. the pork is right in here. Yeah, no, it works. Most people are extremely honest. We've had three problems in nine yeah. years and wow. all three have been caught. And no kidding. Restitution was made. And all right. Yay. There is a camera and it's only checked when there's a this problem. This bacon. Oh, bacon makes the best BLTs. 
It is amazing. Vermont has a tradition in quality and hard work, and that's why the Vermont name carries such a prestige. I think people will be really surprised uh, with how much is available to them just off the side of the road. Depending on the season, stop at an orchard, go berry picking, go apple picking, purchase something for that night, purchase something for the road to take home with you a souvenir. Make sure there's no bear spray on that finger. <laughs> oh my word. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Oh my word. Dude, that stuff might not even make mm. it back to camp. That is so good. We're camping uh, right in the center of the Green Mountain National Forest in a town called Lincoln, which is really cool. We had a tough day today. Lots of class four roads. I think everybody's tired and uh, a little gamey, uh, but uh, it was a fantastic day. I think everybody has had smiles on their face. Are you guys trying some of that local cheese? And wine and, and wine. meat. This is uh, smoked trout. And this is what we uh, picked, little rosé we picked up at that store last night. Some fresh local onions, some local peppers, uh, some garlic, all bought by my boy Todd today at a local a little farm stand on the side of the road. And we're sauteing this stuff up. And we're gonna take it out here, throw some meat in there, some, some beef and some sausage, also locally sourced at a little farm stand. We're gonna make up some tacos, baby. <laughs> So we're in a quintessential Vermont town called Warren, Vermont. It's tucked in between two mountain ranges in what we call the Mad River Valley. They call it the Mad River because the river flows north rather than south. It's a beautiful town. There's a very high-end hotel here. There's a great general store for breakfast and lunch. I think people are really gonna dig this stop. So this bridge has been a floating bridge for 200 years. I, to my knowledge, yeah, yeah. this is what the seventh or eighth. Do you? Uh, well, do you what was cool, they would build it up that big, big hill. Yeah. And the snow and the ice, and then they would kind of slide down. Oh, that's awesome. Onto the ice, you know, and then the ice would melt, and you ha have your new bridge and there. And it's set. But underneath, apparently, it's a new material yeah. flotation system. I think the U University of Maine. Interesting. Or whatever. So anyway, ostensibly, this is guaranteed for a hundred years. Oh wow! Oh, yeah. That'll be something. Well, it will be. It should yeah. be for one point this... two million dollars. The class four roads on this route are uh, pretty extreme, I would say. Um, they're pretty tough, but they're short. I consider myself an intermediate rider and you know I'm on a smaller bike compared to some of the bikes on this uh, ride. I think they're doable by an intermediate rider and especially if you work as a team and I, in fact I would encourage people to try them. Uh, you would challenge yourself uh, but as long as you go slow you can get through them. For the most part, the class four roads are semi-short. There are some sections later in the route that you're in the, in the forest on some class four roads for 15, 20 miles at a time. And uh, that can seem pretty long, can take e even hours for some people. I was really surprised with some of the condition of the track. So the rocks and uh, the deep mud, and it was very unpredictable. One moment we're in the sand, and you blink and you're in the rocks and you blink and you're in the mud and before you know it, you know, you're going through down logs and sticks and, and, then, and then I'm picking my bike up. You come up to it for the first time, it's kind of surprising, like, oh, what do I do, where do I go? But that's the challenge of it too. That's the challenge of, of adventure riding, getting through that stuff for the first time and picking the right line. The rocks are loose, it's kind of rolling around and, and the only thing I still gotta pay attention to is my panniers known close to the sides on the rocks and so forth. Sometimes I forget I have boxes on the side, so 
uh, my box kind of ticked the tree on the way up. And uh, now we're looking at the boxes because yeah, it, it, it kind of crushed things in a little bit, so we're just going to bend them back. Well, I mean, to take a hit like that on the rocks and keep the bike up, right? All right. That's pretty uh -huh. awesome, dude. It's yeah, called it'd be luck. Even better if you didn't hit that. I don't know about that. Huh? I mean, be I some better if I didn't hit the tree? Yeah, just don't hit you. Hey, I can't help it. I'm so wide. You know? It's like driving a Jeep down You've the got trail. a little tiny toy, a little 750 cute thing. That's not going to hit trees. <laughs> the thing, I mean, I had to cut trees oh, down shit. so we have a fire campsite. <laughs> I tell you, I love that stuff. <laughs> Those roads are so flowing, and I just like riding the big bikes there too. You know, the adventure bikes, they have that place for them right there on those type of roads that just, man, I love it. You can ride your limit, you can push it a little bit, you just get a nice little, you can get a flow with someone else too. Yeah, so I was following you with the helmet camera on that. So on the right corners, I would tuck behind you, so I was safely behind you. Then when it opened up, I'd step out where I could see, see get a better angle. Up. We've swapped spots a couple times in there. It opens up my eyes to, some fun stuff that I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to riding some more of that stuff even after this event. There's some more really cool class four roads out there. And then we're gonna get into the, um, into Orange and Washington, Vermont. These are some Eastern towns that are pretty sparsely populated, pretty open to uh, motorized transit. And then eventually we're gonna pop out onto pavement just a few miles outside of, uh, of, of Woodsville, New Hampshire. We'll cross over uh, the Connecticut River and then my job is done. People still maintain this graveyard. They mow the lawn, they put American flags on the veterans' tombstones. It's really a, a sign of respect to these people that uh, develop the town. So uh, this one's marked with a Revolutionary War button. So that means this person fought in the Revolutionary War. And you think about how long ago that was. It's ancient history for Americans. People should stop and, and take a look. Uh, be respectful, of course, but uh, something to see, something that you don't see every day, especially out here in the middle of the woods. So this is your typical small maple syrup operation. Uh, definitely a side business for these guys because it's a little tiny um, shack, but they're producing hundreds of gallons of maple syrup most likely in here. Uh, they work very hard and uh, chopping wood all year round for that one month of uh, maple syrup production. We've seen a lot of these like lines through the forest on the way through here. Yeah. So uh, maple syrup is a huge commodity here in, in Vermont, and this is how we extract the sap from the trees. They boil that down, and for about every 40 gallons of sap that they have, produces one gallon of maple syrup. So it's a lot wow. of work, and it's all, that's why it's so expensive. So precious, huh? It's so precious, the <laughs> yeah. good stuff is, at Liquid least. Liquid gold. This is not your, like, you know, supermarket stuff this no. is this is real deal maple syrup totally pure totally natural all from Vermont um, awesome. really good stuff <laughs> oh man it was a really rocky one there and I slid out my front wheel. Yeah, it's getting late in the day. Yeah, it's 4.30, we started riding around yeah. 7.30. It's been a long yeah. day, I, I have, am beat. I have a saying, and that is nothing good happens after 5 p.m. on yeah. a, an adventure bike. <laughs> yeah. It's a good time to back off. Like yeah. I've led a lot of rides and, and done a lot of long days. And oftentimes people get fatigued, they make mistakes, things that they could have done perfectly earlier in the day after five. So it's good to just sort of back off and just relax. So yeah, this is pretty much the end of the day, guys. We're gonna come out to a couple more dirt roads and we're gonna hit some pavement and we're gonna leave the great state of Vermont. Thanks for showing us Vermont. Dude, it was Did my pleasure, Paul. It it's was right, my man. pleasure. Great. Thank you very much. You buddy. are welcome, gentlemen.
beginning of the route on the western side of the state, we're, very early on, we'll stop at the brick store in Bath, New Hampshire. It's the oldest general store in the country. The owner is a motorcyclist. Great place to stop and pick up provisions or have a little snack. This is Boston Baked Beans. They're pretty hard to find. Sometimes my family ships them to me in California. The owner came outside. We were asking about moose and bear. Um, he explained that there's a very low moose population and he hadn't seen a moose in a year and a half. He said they're dying off and, and you're, you're, you probably won't see one. So we're riding along, right out of my the periphery, a moose comes jumping out of the woods right onto the shoulder, runs right alongside me for probably 10 or 15 feet and ducks back into the woods. That was a, a scary moment. I did not expect to see a moose, especially right on the side of the road. And then we'll get over to White Mountain National Forest, taking some hidden gems of roads out there through the countryside, very picturesque, very bucolic. across a dirt road that had been freshly graded um, and I know the road quite well and there's a hard right-hander that's then that, that's an immediate uphill and typically it's it's corrugated and rutted but they just dumped fresh dirt on it yeah the road, look at look at how soft this uh, is man yeah. it's like freshly graded and you couldn't tell but it was uh, oh, yeah. it's like riding in a sand trap all of a sudden and the back ends were just sliding around and I had I had Mike behind me and I I wanted to see what he was doing but I just didn't have the agility to actually look in the mirror and see and when I came around there Josh and I just slid around and perfectly laid the bike down and was facing back and ran off like she was perfect nothing happened and then before we got sick man she's gonna need some help she turned around lifted her bike up and was going back at it like nothing happened when the boys are coming and you're laying on your side all of a sudden, it's they light like a feather. <laughs> and up we go, and there comes the camera. I'll tell you what, that girl's amazing <laughs> to do what she does on that big bike. You know, when something like that happens, that could have been pretty, uh, could have been pretty ugly for the normal person, but she can ride. So we're here in New Hampshire, and we just came around up a dirt road, and one of the, there's a house that's very close to the road. We had a great opportunity to actually meet the owner this time and it was a, a lovely woman and she was very receptive and, and actually excited that we were rolling through. And I've lived here for 55 years, actually now we're 56 years, and I've grown accustomed to the silence and I've grown accustomed to the game, the wildlife, and uh, they're like members, unfortunately they're not members of the family, but I do protect them, I do post this immediate area and then I leave areas not posted. I had the bear hunters here this morning and the dogs running the hills and I scowled at them as they went by. I don't know that that makes a difference, but we have a great crop of bears and um, not as many deer this year. The coyotes have moved out. Last year I was serenaded every evening with three packs of coyotes and it was pretty gorgeous. But it's probably a good time to mention that we're rolling out a new program called Ride Respectfully. And you know, some of the things to remember, you know, slow down while going through homes, try not to kick up dust, you know, try to minimize engine noise. Um, certainly wave, that's one of the big ones. Always wave. When it's time to use the restroom to be discreet, ride past the house, find a place that's not uh, within sight of the home. Um, also, if you're gonna regroup like we're doing right now to ride past the houses and regroup away from houses and barns and things like that to uh, minimize the impact and increase the chances that we'll keep, to ride, keep having the ability to ride these roads. Well, it was so nice to meet you. Oh, good. Thank good. you. I'm glad, I'm glad you're you. friendly. We're at Stinson Lake, uh, a few miles more dirt. Then we're going to come down, uh, cross over Interstate 93, and that's where we pick up Sandwich Notch Road. So a notch road is, unlike Vermont where they call them gaps, in New Hampshire we call them notches. It's typically mountains, most several of these notch roads are dirt, mostly along riversides, very curvy, very fun. Some of these notch roads are single lane, two-way traffic, so be careful. We 
will stop at a creamery in Sandwich. Nobody there is staffing the little store. You just pick your ice cream, put your money in the box. They've got several unique flavors that are really good. Mm. Is it good? Mm. Mm. Well, that was good lunch. That was, uh, good lunch. That was the best. <laughs> you have this kind of lunch every day. Me too. I could have a different flavor. But every you know day what? Then we'll look like Mike Lafferty. Yeah. They would be like puffy and orange. <laughs> I don't know. Like I'm the biggest one here. I don't understand. Get it. So is that why I can't do wheelies? At least, like I said, at least I got the horsepower of a bike, though, that's, you know, that can get it up when I need to. After we leave Sandwich, we'll come across Lake Chikora with Mount Chikora in the background, a very scenic spot. We'll work our way up through Chikora and get on to the Kankamangas Highway. You'll see lots of nice sights along the Swift River where there's the Rocky Gorge, which is a very favorite swimming hole for a lot of people in the area. In the summer, it's just crowded with people, but in the autumn, like today, it's fairly empty. We all got beat up pretty good in Vermont for three days. And then that, that day in, in New Hampshire, it was just all out fun. It was a really, really great time that day. We'll go right on Bear Notch Road and then into the Bartlett Experimental Forest. There's a, several real nice forest roads out there. We'll take them for a little spin to get us down to Route 302 in the town of Bartlett. On Route 302, it brings us through Crawford Notch. As you approach it, you'll start to see cliffs on either side, massive granite cliffs. And then you actually go through the notch, which is just it's very, very narrow, very twisty. But this is one of the main roads through New Hampshire. We'll bypass the Mount Washington Hotel, a gorgeous old grand hotel, which after World War II, they established the, the World Bank at this hotel. And then we'll get on to Jefferson Notch Road, another fabulous notch road about nine miles long, which is just flowing next to a riverside. The peak of the notch is about 3,000 feet, give or take, and we'll come down to the other side, which brings us to Route 16, down to the Mount Washington Auto Road. One of the biggest highlights of this trip in New Hampshire is Mount Washington Auto Road. It's a spectacular seven mile road up the top of uh, Mount Washington. You get above tree line, it's very twisty, it's hairpins all the way up. It, sheer drop-offs are a thousand feet. A lot of it is paved, but there are some dirt sections. I believe it's one mile of dirt compared to six miles of pavement. If you don't want to ride on the auto road by yourself, you can take the Cog Railway. It, it's actually, the cars and the, and the engine are built on a slope so that you're sitting perpendicular to the mountain. We get to the top of Mount Washington at 6,288 feet. Spectacular views up there. You can get a bite to eat up there. There is a cafeteria. Years and years and years ago, there was a hotel at the top, no longer there, but <laughs> there is some remnants of what it looked like up there. There's a weather observatory up there. Mount Washington is known for the highest recorded wind in the world, 231 miles an hour recorded at the summit of Mount Washington. So it's a beautiful day down here. The, the summit up there is still covered in clouds. And, you, know, you never judge this mountain by what the weather's like at the bottom because it's completely different at the top. I think what Washington has 300 days of cloudiness and you know so we had a, like a, a small window to, to get up there and be able to see that fantastic view. A little windy, colder, you know, definitely changed since we started from the bottom but yeah this is, uh, this is awesome. The views are unbelievable. It's getting blustery. Hopefully we're not going to get blown off the road as we head up to the summit. <laughs> I mean it was a beautiful sunny day down, down below, really twisty, fun ride up there. And then all of a sudden the fog rolled in and the wind started blowing and it was just an inhospitable environment up there. I was hoping that we could get that epic view. Um, is when you get to the top of Mount Washington and it's a sunny day, you have an, like an 80 or 100 mile view. Um, and it's, it's just really, really impressive. This is Mount Washington I know. Look at this view! This is it. <laughs> More times I've been up here and it looks like this than uh, and sunny and not a cloud in the sky, but uh, it adds to the adventure, for sure. This is the only time I've been cold this trip, so that's a good thing. You know, once we got to the top, well, there's 
hardly any views and it was cold and rainy and snowy or whatever it was it was uh it was pretty rad but that place is awesome i'd love to get up there when when you actually can see if that's possible okay guys it's cold and windy up here so we're gonna head back down yeah, we're coming down is is um, I thought it wouldn't be as, as crazy, but when you couldn't see, it was, uh, it was a little difficult. I got a Despite Climb Mount Washington sticker for you. Oh. It's official. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Cover so so do they have one that says, I chucked my bike on Mount Washington? Because <laughs> that might be a more appropriate one here. Slid out on, on my way down Mount Washington, which uh, if I was gonna if I was gonna chuck it on this route, I was hoping not to do it on pavement, but unfortunately that's what happened. On the pavement. <laughs> Rub it in. <laughs> Rub it in. <laughs> on the smooth pavement. That sticker is not appropriate for you, Tim. We're, we're gonna make one for you that, uh, that you fell down Mount Washington. <laughs> Thank you. And there we go. Lesson learned. You know, I don't know if the champ's going to get out of bed. I'm really worried about him. I think he had a little bit too much to drink last night. It's not even like it was some sort of high-end Merlot. This is box wine out of a styrofoam cup at the hotel. Sitting at the hotel in front of our door. Putting him away. <laughs> <laughs> Real classy, yeah. huh? Mike Lafferty, the three-time off-road star. Is it three? How many times was it? I've lost count. Eight, but nobody's counting. Eight! Eight time off road star. <laughs> what happened to nine and ten for crying out loud? You, you know where I'd be? Roll. You know where I'd be if I had nine? Right here doing the same Sitting right thing. Sitting right here yeah. doing the same thing. Being hungover. <laughs> hungover still, you'd still be drinking this wine? <laughs> well, if you had I'd nine, still be drinking box wine. wine. <laughs> oh, they were cups. Styrofoam cups. Styrofoam. Classy. I know. So Brian Pullen is our, our main expert and he's a pilot, um, he's an adventure rider, and he loves his state. The reason we have these stickers, we're going to get into the ATV trail system. You can get the sticker online, part of the funds go to the individual clubs to take care of these trails. The town sets aside a lot of land and you can see how we're going to take, we're, going to, we're here right now, we're going to work our way up through the ATV trail system up to North Waterford. Come up to Gilead right here, which was the uh, the small town in Maine in the 1996 movie Spitfire Grill. Gilead, Maine. There's only two under 200 inhabitants. Well, we just crossed the Androscoggin River, and that put us into Maine. And this is this is kind of a big deal for me because I'm originally from Maine. But what's happening, I've noticed, is the, the further north we've gone, the, the more my main accent has come out. And I'll tell you, I get across the border, and all I want to do is start craving all these main foods. Like I want a fluffanutta and some moxie soda. I'm definitely thinking about a lobster roll and a whoopie pie. Oh, it's like a wicked bad craving. So when you make it all the way up to Maine, it just feels different. It feels empty up here. You don't see as many people. You feel like you're way up north. It's really cooled off. The leaves are starting to change. And it feel, just feels like winter's coming. Hi, my name is Rick Germain, and I'm going coast to coast on a Honda Cub. A little trivia about the Cub. It's the most popular motor vehicle ever made. 110 million of them are currently roaming the earth, or at least started roaming the earth. It'll do 55. Uh, in a pinch, it'll do 60, but it's never happy about it. <laughs> Fuel capacity, 1.0 gallons. Uh, I've done the trip uh, across the country several times on larger motorcycles. Um, just wanted the fun of going a little bit slower, trying to see everything uh, at a little bit... Uh, Less of a frantic pace. What have you ridden before? Either Josh or uh, did the MABDR last year. You did? Yeah. You did. So I recognize awesome. some faces. Really? Yeah, not on this. What'd you yeah. ride it? DR650. Oh, that's a nice. great bike. Yeah. 
adventure yeah. riding. It's really fun seeing these people in the community that know the BDR and embrace the BDR and they're out riding all sorts of adventures on any kind of bike. And the cool thing about a BDR is you can do it on any budget. I mean, you can do it on a 50cc scooter, you can do it on a $25,000 you know, luxury BMW if you want, and you can do it on anything in between. Have a good one. The train will change. In the beginning, we're going to be pretty challenged up until noon through a lot of sand and rock and small trails and maybe even a little single track. That was one of my favorite sections. You have a little bit of sand, a little bit of ruts. You go fairly fast. Uh, just really fun, fun road. So the sand is awesome. Reminds me of home, but uh... Still a little bit different with all the rocks in it too. A little embedded every every you know so often, but uh, big sand berms and stuff. I love that stuff. I could ride that all day. That section was wicked. I tell you what, I was bouncing around more than a rabbit on Red Bull. <laughs> Coming up there, I think I hit everything but the lottery. This route I designed for the motorcycle enthusiast. We are nowhere near a lot of the tourist areas in Maine. This is designed for people to enjoy motorcycling and backcountry discovery. You're gonna be a long way from any human being out here. Hey Brian, what's going on over here? Uh, nothing, just drying off a little bit. My buddy Paul saw an opportunity and he took it. I've been waiting all week to do that to somebody. I'm glad the opportunity was for Mr. Maine. Yeah, so I got a equivalent of a pinch flat. I basically hit a rock really hard. Uh, it bent the rim enough that it broke the bead and all my air has left the station. We had a quite a range of bikes on this trip from you know 700 cc single cylinders up to 21 inch um, you know 790s 850 sort of middleweight bikes and we had a couple of uh, 1200 GSs and this route beat them up pretty good. There was a lot of crash bars that got used, there's a lot of dented skid plates um, we had the toolkit out at least two or three times a day, tightening loose bolts, zip tying things back together, duct taping things. So uh, just know that when you're choosing the bike, make sure that you're not taking your pride and joy, pristine, really expensive bike unless you're prepared to have that thing get dented, scratched, tipped over and make sure that you bring tools and spares. We went through some bolts on this trip, people losing bolts, breaking things. And so we spent a lot of time working on bikes on this trip. So just plan accordingly when you're deciding to do this route. There was a section that we experimented with that we were calling the hero section. This was meant to be a really challenging section. If someone rode this route and they weren't totally satisfied with being challenged, we had this section that was a true test. So we rode that and it ended up being quite difficult. The expert section is part of an old road system. There used to be a community back in the woods there, and it's uh, you're going to see a little bit of everything. You're going to see rock and mud and water and ledge and roots, and there's a pretty good hill climb in there that we used to call the gauntlet, which is really tough. It'll be the most challenging section of Maine for mm -hmm. sure. Have you ever cleared it? One by yeah, by myself. Yeah. No one was around. But nobody was around. To right. Yeah. There's no, there's no, there's no <laughs> Well, I bent my shift lever back there, so um, I'm going to try to see if I can't get it shifted into second before I head up. Come on, we ain't got all day. We got the marquee with a calendar. 
you know, when we got to that challenging section, even though he'd been giving Jocelyn a hard time this whole trip, there was no bigger advocate for Jocelyn, and it was cool seeing him really want her to succeed on that. You're a badass. <laughs> Remember that. You're a badass, and what's happened before, you know, in the past, it doesn't matter. Watching Jocelyn battle her bike up the hero section, um, I was feeling her pain because I saw how she was struggling. You know, the struggle was just written on her face, uh, but I saw how much she had to dig deep and persevere and uh, get to the top. You got it! Hell of an accomplishment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good job, Justin. Not quite how I envisioned it to go. From here on out, it'll be nice. We're all proud of you. That's a brutal. I, I would never take a 12. <laughs> no way. Yeah. It's tough, though, right? Whew. Tough is good. Yeah. I mean, you don't get a better rider if you ride easy stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You got that right. <laughs> I followed Mike Lafferty. I just kind of saw where he went, and there's this granite slab right at the top of the first climb, and he just kind of went right up that. So I took my line, and I got to that granite slab, and I came up to that thinking, there's no way I'm gonna get over this, so I just gave it a little gas to, to get over it. I didn't think I had enough momentum, so I gave it a little bit of throttle, and uh, the front jumped up in the air, and I just parked it into a tree. You're a badass. Well, You're a badass. A what happened is behind you. That was more of a dumbass. Oh shit. <laughs> My windscreen is completely fucked, so I should probably go start duct taping that up. I tried to prep everybody that, that it was tough. I wanted people to know that this was truly a difficult section, and I think it lived up to its name. Today's route in, in Maine finished up a little on the difficult side. It was a little extreme, I would say. I enjoy it, I do like it, but if I'm riding with five or six people that I know aren't gonna enjoy it, I'm gonna go around it too. My advice for this BDR is that uh, this probably shouldn't be your first BDR. I think you should work up to this one. If you're looking for a really big challenge, the Northeast BDR will, I think, give you everything you wanted, maybe more. Um, however, if you are you know, a beginner rider, intermediate, and you wanna do this one, but uh, you're not a highly skilled off-road rider, you can just skip the class four roads. Most of this route is fairly easy. It's just the class four roads that are really challenging. So you can skip those and then it's a much more achievable route for a lot of people. Myself and the team have been working on this route for nearly two years. This is the first time that our organization uh, has come out and ridden it as a group. And that's why we call it an expedition. And, and not just you know an adventure ride. We're actually working on this on this route to the very end. When we're out here filming, seeing it with a whole range of different bikes and skill sets. It, it allows us to really see things with clarity, and we can sometimes make some last-minute decisions on what stays in or what's you know an advanced versus the main route, that sort of thing. What are you looking at? A pick of you on that last climb when you uh, <laughs> you yard sailed it. The average guy. That thinks he can do it, he's gonna get stuck in that in that never never land. He gets stuck, spends a night in the forest, breaks his bike, then he puts it online. What's that what's that gonna do to the BDR? There's gonna be a guy that doesn't belong there with his buddies and his buddies tell him, come on, come on, come on, and they don't realize that once you slide into that first rocky hip, rocky climb down, you got you know, there's no way to get out. There's no real reason to have it. I, I, I'm old enough that I don't want to break any more bones, and, and that, you know, or if I can avoid it, and mitigate a little bit of risk. I mean, this tough stuff in Vermont is is amazing, you know, and, and that's that's all doable. This is just that next step up that I think might be over the edge, might be just over the edge.
Rangeley is actually halfway between the equator and the North Pole at the 45th latitude. It was started by a son of an English gentleman who bought 31,000 acres from Massachusetts and gave it to his son. His son inherited it and he started the community up there. We're staying in this three-story historic building with this big porch out front. It's really nice, an amazing bar and restaurant inside. So uh, we've eaten well and stayed pretty well in places that just have a lot of charm, a lot of character. This part of the route probably came together faster than any other section. Because of its remoteness, it was, you know, it was a great place to end the route. And it's just, it's a lot of fun riding. There's some super technical stuff at the beginning, and then it opens up to some really, really, really fun riding um, all afternoon and for the rest of the ride up to the border. The further we get to the north, the more it's gonna open up and get more flowing and quicker and uh, in the more remote regions. I'm glad we're ending up in Maine. And um, definitely making some plans to come back and maybe go a little further north or do something else coming back up here. I want to bring some friends and my family up here and, and do some stuff, but it's, uh, it'd be good to get her done actually. I am had a trip before this and then it's 10 days, so I'm looking forward to maybe putting the bike away for just a little bit. <laughs> This time of year to ride this is ideal. The foliage is starting to turn. It's really beautiful. The weather, the humidity's down. This is the epic time to ride it. It'll be really enjoyable for people. It has a certain smell, like the trees, the spruce and the pine trees. You know, I recognize that, that scent. And boy, I haven't seen these fall colors in so many years. It's really neat to meander through this little dirt road with the just bright colored trees coming along one after the other after the other. It's, just, it's gorgeous. There's reds, oranges, greens, yellows. I've never seen anything like this. Uh, all my life I wanted to come to the East Coast and experience this, these leaves changing. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous. I think they snapped it. it. It happened in like what the last two days, not even. It switched over quite a bit. The further we keep going, the more colors that are getting. And they haven't fall, fallen, which is awesome. They're still on the trees and it's turning over. So it's pretty spectacular. It's an awesome view, that's for sure. The main state bird, the mosquito, is not here right now. So things are great. We've gone through seven states. Um, so we've seen a lot of change um, in weather, um, in climate, you know, in. In colors, it's, it's the further we got north, the more colorful we got. Today was just an explosion of color, which we were really hoping for. Um, but it's been a really great journey. A lot of Maine is owned by logging companies. It's a primarily a working forest. Uh, we actually have more standing timber in Maine now than ever in history. So it's a sustainable forest. So you'll see a lot of logging operations in route as we go. The final portion of this route, I think, will be really, really phenomenal. From Rangeley to Jackman, to me, is al it's almost like you're, uh, you're levitating through the forest. The, the way the road undulates, you get into almost like a dream sequence, and it's really amazing. Uh, it's like flying through the forest with great views. I would, I would not miss that for anything. 
Well, we've been promised rain since we've been riding on the Northeast BDR. And finally, we're 30 minutes right before the border. It starts raining really hard. But you know what? I have a smile on my face. It's just part of the adventure. I love it. Cold, rainy. This is East Coast right here. What was dirt is now mud. What was sand is now slimy. So uh, the adventure continues all the way to the bitter end. <laughs> This is the best time to do the, the route by far because things are dry. This is the driest you're ever going to find it up here. You know, Maine is a water making machine, so and with all the snowpack early in the, in the season, water is going to be a big issue. Water crossings and mud. So it definitely changes the time of year that you try to attempt this route. I'm kind of glad to be alive at the moment. Um, I thought, I really thought I was building a good friendship with Jocelyn Snow, but at, you know, 40 miles an hour, in the middle of nowhere, she chucks her pannier off at me, and I have to, I have to swerve around it to avoid it. I thought I heard something, it was like, oh, and then the bike got a little bit light on one side. It's like she, she pushed the eject button and it just, it just went, shot, shot my direction. All is good, and I think we're still friends. We friends? <laughs> right on. All fun. Jackman is at the base, really, of the Allagash Wilderness. Jack, Jackman is one of the last towns before you get into complete and utter wilderness in the Allagash. The route does actually finish at, at what they used to call the Old Canada Road, which was the primary transportation up to the, right just northwest of Jackman. We're going to stop right there at the Border Control Station. Woo, that's Canada over there. We are at the end of the 10th BDR route we've created and uh, we've sort of picked up key team members along the way over the last 10 years. The organization is really strong, so we're blessed to have this team 10 years in. We couldn't have done it without them and I'm just really grateful. <laughs> so I'm pretty honored that the route that I had um, something to do with developing happens to be the 10th BDR route. That is awesome. 1,400 miles. That is the best trophy ever. <laughs> Thank you guys. Awesome. Thanks, team. Yeah. Well. Yes. Woo! The group that we've been riding with, we've come together and bonded as friends. And to me, that's you know the best part of the whole trip. This BDR is going to be one of the favorite routes. It's uh, like a variety pack. Everything from smooth roads to technical rocks, the big farms and the unique people. The whole thing together has just been an incredible experience. And I'm already thinking in my head when I can get back out this way to do it again. And it's a great stepping stone from the Mid-Atlantic BDR in terms of the de degree of difficulty, the challenging terrain, and the remoteness. So for people that wanted a little bit more after riding the Mid-Atlantic BDR, they're going to be really pleased with the Northeast BDR. The Northeast BDR is a long route. It's a commitment. If you can't commit to an eight or nine day ride, we've built the route so that you can do it in sections. They're all great. They're all different. They're, you know, they're all unique in their own way, but again, Together, they make a fantastic route. Pumped that I did it. I'm, I'm pumped that, uh, you know, I want to come back and I want to bring some friends with me. Feels like a really fitting end to the Northeast BDR. So many people are going to enjoy this route and have their own interesting journey that will be uh, with them for the rest of their life. Yards are mans uh, manscaped. <laughs> They're manscaped. The yards are manscaped. I haven't manscaped in a while. I'm in the. F <clears throat> See, I can't even pronounce my name. So we created a 14,000, yeah, 14,000 mile BDR. <laughs> it takes you about three years to do. Yeah, I want you to cut. No, I keep rolling right Could now. Could you please cut? Good morning. <laughs> This is for the movie. Oh. Take three. <laughs> yeah, so. The highlight of a box of wine outside her hotel room.
Battle of the gimbals. Gimbal time. <laughs> I ran over the cameraman. Accidentally rubbing bear spray on your balls is something I, I don't recommend. Uh, but I will tell you, you know, some people are into that. This is a dog. This is neat to see how this production happens. Yeah, yeah, this is fascinating. Blah, 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 blah. Right, <laughs> Definitely pick yourself up some maple syrup. Come on. Sold my car to buy a motorcycle. My parents weren't pleased with that, but whatever. And I uh, volunteered with the organization BDR to. Oh my God, this is the bug. Sorry. What brings you out here? Jesus. And I'm a newbie. I've only been here 20 years. Hey, nice talking with you. Me too. Oh my Thanks God, again. nice camera there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is, you figure it out. <laughs>